Hi, folks. My name is Josh Donlin. First of all, I'm very sorry and disappointed that I won't, uh, wasn't able to make this in person and be there with you guys over the next few days. Uh, I'm sure I missed a lot of interesting and fun stuff, but it was um, super bad timing and unfortunate timing. Uh, and I wasn't able to get out of some of work-related stuff in Chile. So, uh, Mason asked me to put together a short slides show uh, that briefly talks about a little bit about me and what I do and my work in Chile. Uh, it'll be quick, so hopefully it'll be quick and painless, uh, but hopefully it'll be also semi-interesting to you guys, and hopefully it might lead to us uh, getting a chance to interact uh, in person, either formally or informally, uh, while we are in Chile in the next few months. So... I run a small nonprofit called Advanced Conservation Strategies. It's based in the U.S. in terms of being a U.S.-based nonprofit, but most of our work is outside of the U.S., lots in Latin America, a little bit outside of Latin America, and we also run a number of programs um, in the U.S. I've been running that NGO for about 10 years. It's very small by design. Uh, all of our projects are highly collaborative, either with other NGOs, often with foundations, either as grantees or consultants, um, or startups. Um, we do work with a, a number of startups, so we tend to try to work across sectors and across disciplines, focused on solutions that might be our, one of our niches, if you will. Um, and then I also have a adjunct position at Cornell at the moment with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which I, I run a number of programs and are involved in a number of programs with them, and previously with the uh, uh, Department of College, the College of Evolutionary Biology at Cornell. So a little bit of background on, on me and my work in Chile. So originally I'm, I'm trained as an ecologist, um, and for a long time, I worked in kind of the realm of what I would call traditional conservation biology. Um, particularly, I spent a long, uh, a long time working on islands and the restoration of islands via the removal of invasive species. But for the past ten years or plus, uh, I've been working mainly at the intersection of entrepreneurialism entrepreneurial approaches to environmental problem solving, design, in particular trying to steal approaches and methodologies from the design field and apply them to environmental settings and environmental conservation. Uh, I started working in Chile back in the mid-2000s. Uh, first, almost exclusively on invasive species issues, so I helped run a large Island Restoration Program in the Galapagos in the mid-2000s, uh, which was one of the largest successful invasive species eradications in the world. Because of our experience from that project, uh, we were invited down by the Chilean Argentine government when they started to uh, started thinking about something needed to be done with respect to invasive beaver and, and the issues and problems they were causing in Kyoto Fuego. So I was a part of a small international team that was hired by the two governments to conduct a feasibility study on what were the options and is was is or was eradication an option with respect to management options for the beaver. That program is still ongoing. It is very slow, aircraft carrier-like in terms of progress, but both countries do now have pilot projects that are funded by the Global Environmental Facility and are building capacity around being able to control and hopefully eventually eradicate a beaver on both sides of the border of Tierra Fuego. Um, during that same time in building upon that project, I was a co-PI on a National Science, Found, National Science Foundation funded grant where we were actually looking at both oh, social yeah. dimensions and 
ecological dimensions of beavers and landowners, mainly ranchers, both on the Argentine and Chilean side of the border. And that work was conducted while I was a Fulbright Fellow here in Chile in 2010 and 2011. During that same time, I actually, for, a, for the David Lucille Packer Foundation, was asked to do a, coast, a coastal and marine conservation assessment of Chile. At the time, the Packer Foundation had been investing quite a bit of money in northwest Mexico in coastal and fisheries and marine conservation, and they were interested in scoping other potential locations where there might be uh, potential for impact in terms of funding funding a grant program. Um, that, that assessment, fast forward, and now led to Packard adopting Chile as a country, one of their focal countries under their oceans program. The ocean program gives away about $60 million a year uh, on, in various countries and themes, and now Chile is uh, a focal country where there is an ongoing grant program funding a variety of NGOs and coastal and marine issues. Alongside that, also, uh, the Walton Family Foundation has recently started. It's in the second year of a similar program. It's uh, more focused on fisheries conservation, but uh, it's, it has a country program. So now, in 2018, there's, there's quite a bit of funding uh, involved, uh, available in Chile for marine and uh, coastal conservation, and I'm involved with the Packer Foundation and the Walton Foundation, both as a consultant and as a grantee um, under those programs. So much of ACS's work can fall under uh, three main realms. One, as I just mentioned, we do a lot of strategy, program design, and monitoring evaluation work for foundations. That includes quite a bit of work here in Chile. We also design and implement environmental incentive programs uh, as an NGO with our collaborators. We do that here in Chile, we do that in Mexico, we do that in the United States. Uh, and that might include programs such as environmental, an environmental program that tries to incentivize bird monitors in Mexico, or like a program I'll talk a little bit about in a, in a second, which is trying to work uh, with small scale fishermen and incentivize them uh, to set up voluntary marine reserves. We also run uh, a bit of, we also have a number of projects that are focused on policy relevant applied research. So for example, we have a large project focused on trying to understand seafood fraud, seafood mislabeling globally. But a lot of attention and some research with respect to seafood mislabeling, you go by Alaska salmon, it turns out to be Atlantic salmon. We don't really understand the extent um, of how often it's happening, where it's happening, why it's happening, particularly why it's happening, and what are the behavioral triggers and settings that where fraud is occurring. So we have a, we have a very little understanding. We know what's happening. We don't understand kind of where, why it's happening. We also understand, we do not understand the impact very well. People like to think and there's anecdotal evidence and there's big environmental impacts and there's these potential health impacts, but we really don't have a grasp on whether or not this, this seafood mislabeling, seafood fraud is precipitating impacts on the water, is it precipitating economic impacts, or is it potentially precipitating a health impacts. So we have a program trying to understand that and trying to inform policies that are being revised and being drafted in the United States, the EU, and elsewhere. So during my time here at, at, um, in Chile, on my four by, I'm going to be working on three main things or three main activities. First is this program that I've been working, that I've been running with my colleague Stefan Gelsich. Uh, for the past five or six years, it's called the Capital Azul Marine Reserve Program. Capital Azul is now a foundation in Chile that we set up to run this program and eventually take it over for advanced conservation strategies. In a nutshell, uh, it works with fishermen's 
to incentivize fishermen to set aside a marine reserve within their territorial rights. So the fisheries law in Chile is very intriguing in thinking about setting up these voluntary programs because of a fishing co-op, a small-scale fishing co-op has their act together, they can apply to the government, they can apply to the government and get exclusive access rights to a stretch of the ocean, stretch of the coast. They call those adios de manejo, a lot of people call them turfs, territorial user rights for fisheries. Our program kind of builds on this turf system. There's 700, 700 and change of these all along the coast of Chile. There's a lot of them in central Chile where there tends to not be any marine protected areas. Thanks to research by Stephen Gelsich, Juan Carlos Cadilla, and other Chilean ecologists, we know a lot about the ecology of these turfs. And we also know a lot about the social dimensions of the fishing co-ops that run these terms. So we've been able to design this program on top of that information and, and co-design it with the fishermen, if you will, in that the fishermen set aside a portion of their no portion of their turf or exclusive use rights as a no-take zone, as a little marine reserve, and they agree not only that the co-op members will fish there, but they also agree to do anti-poaching surveillance so outside folks won't come in and fish there as well. Our idea is to scale this program up. Right now we have a number of co-ops in central Chile that have been managing these no-take reserves for a couple of years. And now the goal is to try to scale this at least in central Chile to build a network of fisher-managed marine reserves in an area where there are no formal marine protected areas, government-run marine protected areas, and there's probably not going to be any anytime soon for lots and lots of uh, political reasons. Most of the marine protected areas, actually all the uh, large marine protected areas, are all down in southern Patagonia, which uh, has a lot less people. So we're working on scaling this program, building the capacity of Capital Azul to run that program, uh, strengthening the government relationships with the government agencies like Suna Pesca, and we're also looking to shift away from philanthropic dollars, which pays for this program now, foundation money, toward diversifying its revenue through uh, domestic opportunities, Chilean opportunities, whether or not that's trying to connect the seafood that the co-ops are catching with the marine protected area and trying to get a premium, or that's thinking about trying to integrate this into the pending biodiversity law, uh, which has quite a bit of interest, the government has quite a bit of interest in thinking about uh, reframing and rewriting the biodiversity offset program within the new biodiversity law. So we're kind of pivoting away. We've done lots and lots of social science around designing the program that fishermen will sign up for. And we're now running that program. We, we figured out kind of the transactional infrastructure and monitoring the biodiversity benefits. Now we're pivoting, doing the social science with restaurants, seafood owners, seafood buyers, etc talking to the government about biodiversity offsets to see if we can diversify and find a non-philanthropic funding model, which would make the program a little bit more sustainable in terms of not relying on 100% uh, philanthropy money over the long term. Also during the uh, Fulbright tenure, I'm going to be teaching a sh uh, short course on environmental design, uh, largely looking at trying to design and uh, environmental programs through the lens of the participants as opposed to through the lens of the endangered species or endangered resource. The environmental sector tends to do the latter, and often we design these programs that are optimized for endangered species or optimized for water conservation, and no one signs up for them, right? So uh, one of our natures and what we try and do is try to uh, steal methodologies like human-centered design and design programs where we can actually, we know or we can predict quantitatively if the program looks like this, 20% of the fishermen are signed up. If the program looks like this, 85% of the pro, uh, uh, 
fishermen will sign up. So we're going to te we're teaching a short course for graduate students around using human-centered design and thinking about incentives for program design. Also, uh, we'll be talking about outcome-based approaches and market models and doing a, a kind of a survey and, and exposing the students to a variety of social and natural science methodologies that can help uh, better design environmental incentive programs as well as methodologies outside of social and natural science, like human-centered design. Lastly, I'm going to be um, trying to increase exchanges through or connected to a program that I spent two years designing, largely from a human-centered design perspective that I, uh, uh, that I just mentioned, which is called the Coastal Solutions Fellows Program. Coastal Solutions Program program was just launched last year. It's going to run for 10 years. Uh, the program supports six fellows a year. It's very broad. The only requirements are you have to be you have to be a citizen of a Latin American country. You have to be young, i.e., first 10 years of your career. You have to <clears throat> be interested in working across disciplines. So you have to, if you're an NGO, you have to be interested in working with the private sector, with the academic sector. If you're an academic, you have to be interested in working uh, with the private sector and the NGO sector. You also have to be interested in working across uh, fields. If you're a planner, you have to be interested in working with a natural scientist. If you're a natural scientist, you have to be interested in working with an architect. The whole goal of the program is to build capacity, local capacity, in Latin America along the Pacific America's flyway from Mexico to Chile and to promote solutions at coastal sites, particularly where the sites that are important for shorebirds. So the program is going to run for 10 years, uh, provides financial a financial award, but also access to a network, access to training, access to retreats, access to mentors, um, and access to train, uh, training outside of your country. Uh, so the first six fellows were just chosen. Two of them are from Chile, two of them from Colombia, and two of them are from Mexico. So there's an advisory board. We're really trying this uh, a big a lot of money behind the idea of trying to increase and build a community around coastal conservation in Chile uh, from the Packard Foundation, including this program, which is run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, but it's uh, funded by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Packard Foundation. Uh, so this is, we think, it's a super excited program. Uh, and we're trying to build the capacity and the momentum around this program, uh, which includes trying to build a network and increase exchanges, not only between disciplines within a country, but also disciplines across countries in terms of coastal planning, in terms of coastal development, in terms of uh, important wetland conservation sites for, uh, for shorebirds, such as Chilaway, for example. So. This is a really uh, neat kind of two-minute video that you guys can play if you would like after um, you after I sign off. That kind of explains the program, um, so that might be might be of interest to some of you. And that's it. So I will sign off. And sign off and uh, and I hope that I will get a chance to meet you guys in person at some point um, and this is my contact information and again sorry to have missed you over the past two days I'm sure it's my loss uh, especially since I didn't get a chance to learn about all the cool stuff you guys are um, up to but uh, best of luck with your work and uh, thanks for listening to Hopefully not uh, too.
boring couple minutes about what I do. Take care.